Hi everyone, I'm Terry from Tangerine Mountain Imports and Designs. We are your kimono vendor. We see you every year at Anime Iowa. Now, unfortunately, we can't be together this year, but we love you all and we miss you very much. So we teamed up with the leadership at Anime Iowa to bring you some kimono-related cultural programming that you can watch in the comfort of your own home. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to wear several different types of kimono. So we're going to cover the yukata, everyday kimonos, we're going to cover men's, and we're even going to bring on a special guest that you also usually see around the vendor hall at Anime Iowa every year. Now, a quick word about gender and kimono. We can't ignore the fact that for a decent chunk of modern history, kimono were associated with gender, certain types with certain genders. But at the same time, we don't want to trap kimono in this box in which they're not allowed to evolve with the current times. The whole theme of Japanese fashion history is, is change, really. So in this modern day, we still will retain certain distinctions for kimono because structurally there is some difference between men's and women's and how you would wear them. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that we convey to people that you are the expert in you. You're the expert in your gender, your sexuality, your disability, your marital status, what you feel comfortable wearing. So for us, we want to encourage people to wear kimono no matter what. Whatever you feel comfortable with wearing, that's what you need to focus on. So if we say that something is men's versus women's or it's unmarried women's versus married women's, please keep in mind that these are distinctions that exist, but they are not hard and fast rules that you have to strictly adhere to, otherwise you can't wear kimono. We've seen far too many examples, and really awesome examples, in Japan, in Japanese fashion magazines, and all over the place that really illustrate to us that kimono are always evolving, and that's one of the most beautiful things about kimono. So please allow kimono to evolve and incorporate them into your life the way that you feel is best for you. The yukata is a light summer cotton kimono typically worn to festivals and, let's say, anime conventions. So to illustrate how to wear a yukata, I need to summon the Tangerine Mountain intern, Lisa. Hey! Yay! Let's get you in your yukata. All right, I'll have you come right over here. Now, we may notice that the yukata is a little bit long. Um, this is very typical, especially for yukata that are typically considered women's. So we're going to lift the hemline of the yukata so that the back of it is right around the ankles. And then the way that we wrap it is we're going to put your right hand side down first and then your left hand side. But before we totally finish wrapping, we want to make sure that this left panel is crossing where we want it to cross. So we might just kind of do a quick test. Like, oh, is that where we want it? We might need to shimmy it over a little bit. And then we're going to basically work with everything below the waist. The top is going to be messy. It might be blousey. It might look like a mess. That's okay, don't worry about it. We are focused on the bottom first. And then in order to get this, to stay put, we're going to use our koshihimo. You can use a koshihimo, which is basically um, a sash that holds the kimono closed as you get everything situated, um, or you can use like a sash, you can use a shoelace, you could, you could use anything long enough to wrap around your body. Now, if you can wrap it around twice, that's great. If not, don't worry about it. I'm gonna tug this just to make it snug. Now, how you tie it is a little bit up to you. I'm actually gonna pull the collar back just a bit so we can see what's going on here. How you tie it is up to you. Um, many times when I'm at a convention, I actually like to tie it in a knot because I know that I'm going to be moving around quite a bit, but typically, if you're not going to be running around like a monkey, you're going to twist and pinwheel that tie. 
You can pinwheel it twice if you want. It's, it's all good. And then you're going to take the ends and tuck them in around the hemal. You can tuck it all the way back if you want. It's all good. I'm going to bring this back here. Tuck it around once or twice. Oh, it's all good. Okay? So once that is all tucked, then we're going to just do a quick check, make sure, yep, we like the bottom. Bottom's looking pretty good. If something came a little bit uneven, you might want to tug up a little bit on the collar. All right. Now we're going to work on the top. So for the top, we're gonna first of all try to make sure that the back seam is lined up with the spine as best we can. Also, typically for women's pieces, you want to have about the size of a fist as far as draped to the nape of the neck. This can be very hard to achieve, especially if you're wearing a shoulder bag so at conventions, you may not want to do this too much. It's up to you. We're going to, first of all, blouse over the koshihimo. So we're gonna basically start pulling all of this excess fabric up without pulling up so high that we mess up the bottom, okay? And we're going to fold this over that chemo, so it's going to basically look bloused, like this. Now I'm gonna have you turn. We're also going to want to do the same thing, thank you, along the front and the sides. Now when you're putting this on yourself, one thing you can do is you can kind of reach a hand to the underarm and here, and just start to kind of use your hand to kind of blade it down. And again, we're going to maintain the right si side being down first, and then the left side. Some people use the mnemonic leftover rice to remember. So now we're starting to look like we're not so messy. So from here, you can put the OB on, on top of this and be good to go. Sometimes you might feel like you want to add an additional sash or an additional koshihimo just to keep everything locked down firmly. So you can add a koshihimo. You can also add what's called a magic belt. This is a belt that is rubberized on one side. You can also add something called a datejime which is basically a sash that has a little bit of a stiffener in here, not much. It's really up to you. For you, Kata, a lot of times, I'll just use another koshihimo. So I'm going to take this, place it right about where the obi is going to go. And again, same kind of thing, just you know, give it a little tug. Especially if you're at a convention, it might be tempting to go very tight to make sure that things aren't going to go anywhere as you move around. But do please keep in mind that you're running around someplace where it might be hot, you might be dehydrated, don't go too tight, we don't want anyone to pass out. Okay, so now that we have the yukata on and it's secure and it's feeling pretty good here, now we're going to put the obi on. We have some choices. We could use a hanhaba obi like this. However, we've got another plan for this obi with a really, really cool look that we're gonna show you in just a little bit. Typically, this width of obi is what's used with yukata though, because yukata are informal and this is considered a relatively informal obi. That said, we have seen in Japanese fashion magazines some fashion-forward looks that you can achieve with a yukata and a nagoya obi. Nagoya obi are a little different than hanhaba because they start out narrow and then they get wider at the end. So we're going to show you something that we've done at conventions a lot. It's a really fun way of wearing nagoya obi and it's a great way to wear them in ways that you don't need a lot of accessories or extra pieces that you might have to remember to bring to a convention. So we're going to show you that. 
First, we're gonna start, of course, by unfolding it to the skinny side. And it's gonna seem long. It's uh, typically 325 to 350 centimeters. So I'm gonna have you turn and face this way because we're gonna basically treat this Nagoya Obi as if it was a Hanhaba Obi for the purposes of making a Bunko bow. So I'm gonna start with a little bit over the shoulder, just like I would with a Hanhaba, and I'm gonna place some along the back here. I'm gonna have you turn in this direction and we're going to wrap twice. And as we wrap, the second time, I'm gonna try to make sure that this is getting a little bit more snug. Keep going for me. All right, so this time around, I'm gonna have you step right there. Excellent, all right. So make sure, making sure it's snug, making sure that this part, I'm already gonna kind of pre-fold this because this is gonna end up being folded in half. Again, just like we would for a Hanhaba Obi. Place that along your shoulder here. So we're going to bring this portion of the Obi up and I'm gonna to start to get it ready for a knot. I'm gonna bring this around and I'm going to make the knot. I'm gonna tuck the short end underneath the long end and pull it through. There's my knot. Again, keeping this folded in half, I'm gonna place it along the shoulder. Now for a Hanhaba Obi, typically your bow would be about this wide. But because we're working with the Nagoya, it enables us to make a wider bow. So I'm going to fold this OB in on itself. I'm basically gonna create a loop. How big your loop is is really up to you. A lot of times shoulder width is good, but again, it's up to you. I'm gonna basically make like a rectangle along the back of the body here. And you can kind of hook your fingers into the obi and place them kind of along the shoulders just to gauge for yourself where you want this to be. And now that I have my, my stack of obi, I'm gonna find the middle, find the middle, and I'm gonna pleat it. I'm gonna fold, fold, fold. We call this making mountains. So you make three mountains for a really wide portion of the obi, two mountains if it's skinny. So now that I have my pleats, my mountains, this is what it looks like on the reverse side. Here's what it looks like on the front. I have my knot, I have my bow. I'm going to put the bow against the knot. And I'm gonna grab both the bow and the knot so that you can kind of see my fingers. Now, I'm not going to touch this bottom layer. We're gonna leave that alone. I'm going to bring this portion around, because this is going to be the middle of our bow. I'm gonna bring it up underneath both the knot and the bow. So this is basically what holds the bow to your back. And I'm going to pull this through. I like to wiggle this just to make sure that this is nice and tight so that um, this, end up, this doesn't end up falling apart here. If I have enough to go around a second time, I will do that. I don't think I quite have enough here. So from here, I'm going to, now I'm gonna worry about this bottom layer. Right now the bow is just attached to that first, the top layer. Now we're gonna worry about this layer because we've got our loop, we're gonna tuck it between the body and that bottom layer of obi. And we might have to reach under and straighten that. And then from here, we're basically just flipping the bow. If you have a second layer, you can always make it a little bit of an asymmetrical bow, pop out a little side. It's up to you. This is an art form. You don't have to do it any one particular way. I'm also going to make sure that it's basically lined up with this seam here. And once that's done, I'm just gonna check and make sure, yes, it's even. Okay, and so at this point here, 
we're done. This is it. This is all you need to do to wear a yukata, even with a Nagoya Obi at a convention. And you find it actually is a really cute look, especially with this nice big bow for a big festival like a convention. Now I'm going to have you turn around. Okay, so now we are wearing a nice summer Nagoya Obi with this yukata. In the front, it looks just like a Hanhaba Obi, but in the back, you have the surprise of a lovely big bow. We always say at conventions to bow big or bow home, so here we are. Now, if you're finding that the front of the Obi seems a little bit bendy, there's a couple of things that you can do to help prevent that. In Japan, typically, you would pad your body underneath the kimono. So before you get anything on, you might um, strap some towels, you know, some little folded up towels to your body to help even out any curvature. However, we're talking about conventions. We're talking about hot weather. We're talking about people who are dehydrated. We don't necessarily want to add more layers if we don't have to. One of the tools that can help, whether you're padding or not, is called an obiita. So I have one right here. It's basically just a stiffened board. Usually they're plastic these days. Sometimes they're cardboard. And what we're going to do is just go between the, the bottom layer of the obi and the top. We're going to just slide it on in, press down, tuck it, seat it right there. All right. And then now we have a nice smooth look in here. So at this point, we're done. We're wearing a lovely yukata and a summer weight Nagoya obi with a big bow in the back at our convention or festival. Cool. So one of the ways that we dress people at conventions is to incorporate kimono in with their cosplay. So to help me show you this, we have Lisa, our intern, who is in cosplay from Love Live. And we are going to dress her in this lovely yukata. So first we're going to start with the yukata. We're going to put it on just like we do the kimono in any situation here. We're going to take our koshihimo or sash. And instead of bringing the yukata, I'm have you turn this way, thank you. Instead of bringing it to the ankle, you know, first of all, skirt. Second of all, we want to incorporate this yukata into her cosplay. So we want to make it look like one whole big look. Sometimes people will call this style walolita. Um, we've also seen it called Matsuri style as well in Japan. So I'm basically crossing the right side over the left and I'm just going to kind of gauge how much of the skirt I want to show and how high I want to bring this up. So this is going to depend a little bit on your actual cosplay and it's also going to depend a little bit on how, um, like what kind of a look you want to achieve. So I've seen people do this with um, steampunk. I've done it myself too. Sometimes I'll go a little bit longer. Sometimes I'll bustle the skirt. Sometimes I'll, I'll do that. So I'm gonna do this. And remember that right away, this is gonna seem messy. That's okay because we're just getting this koshihimo or a sash, you could use anything. We're just tucking this up underneath itself. All right, and then from here, we're gonna just start blousing. We're gonna straighten out the top part. There we go. Okay, so we know that this is going to fall long. We wanna show the bow. We want to show some drape to the back. We want to show off this part of the dress though. We don't want to cover this entirely. So what we're going to do is start pleating this back. We're going to kind of go all around, tugging little pleats. We're basically playing with the fact that kimono can change based on how you tie it and how you drape it. So that by the time we get this down to here, this is going to basically form a second ruffle. 
gonna look really cute by the time we're done. Now I'm gonna have you turn here. If you want to, if your yukata is long enough, you can even take another koshihimo and create another ruffle in here. And actually, I really like the way that that looks. So I think we're gonna do that. I'm gonna come in here with this koshihimo. I'm not even gonna tie this real tight. I'm just twisting here. Sometimes people will twist twice, sometimes they'll just twist once, and then this just gets wrapped around itself. And it depends on how your comfort level. Sometimes people do knot it, sometimes I will knot mine. Just because I'm at a convention, I don't want this going anywhere. But sometimes it's nice to have a bit of a quick release in case you're really hot. Okay, now I'm gonna have you turn. Okay, so we're still a little bit not quite where we want to be in front yet. And the middle here, again, it's going to look messy, but the obi is going to be what brings this all together. You would think that this had been maybe stitched in place to create this ruffled effect here, but no. It's just sashes, that's all. And that's really the beauty of wearing kimono, that you're achieving an amazing look. No buttons, no snaps, you don't even need to stitch this. You just tie a couple of sashes. And this yukata, which looks like this very straight up and down kind of look, has been transformed into this amazing cosplay. Once you're reasonably happy with where it is, that's when you're gonna to wanna to take another sash of some kind or something that's called a magic belt. And you're gonna to want to use that to help lock this down so that when you get the obi on, everything works, okay? So we're gonna get a magic belt. This is what's called a magic belt. It's basically rubberized on this side and this helps to keep fabric from slipping as you wear the kimono throughout the day. So it's gonna have some kind of a Velcro piece on one side and then usually the other side is just the Velcro can grip wherever, okay? So we're gonna place this roughly where we want the obi to go, wrap it around, and just press down a little bit so that the Velcro grabs. We're just gonna double check to make sure that all of our ruffling is where we want it. And then from here, we're going to grab the obi. Now this type of obi is called a hanhaba obi. It's a half width obi. And so I'm gonna have you face that way for me. All right, so again, you can see back here, this is basically the attachment for the magic belt. It just Velcros down. You can go really tight if you want, but um, most of the time you don't really have to because this, this thing has a lot of grip. You can see it's really kind of, I'm really having to work to straighten the fabric. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some obi over the shoulder here, and then I'm going to have you turn in this direction. So the goal is here, keep turning for me. You're going to wrap, Go ahead, twice, okay? Sometimes people put a little divot in the obi there. I'm going to create a twist in the obi, keep going for me, so that we can show off the sparkly side. Okay, pause right there, excellent. So I'm basically going to bring the long end over here. I'm gonna gather this up and just sort of make sure that this is snug against here, that this, this whole thing is snug on the body. You don't want to cut off your oxygen supply, but you just want it to be snug. I'm going to steal this. I'm going to just kind of fold that in half. This is going to become the middle of the bow. I'm going to tuck it up underneath this layer to, to basically make a knot, okay? And the knot's going to look just sort of like a twist or a wave even. I'm going to keep this narrow. I'm going to pass it back, so hang on to that. 
And then I'm going to take this long part of the bow. Now there's many ways to make a bow. You can always turn the bow in on itself a few times, or you can do something that's been really popular in Japan, and you can ruffle the bow. You start at about the shoulder width, and you just sort of zigzag the obi in on itself. And basically you want to stack it so that when you line this up, the middle of where you want the bow to be is sitting above this knot, okay? Now this part of the obi, you're gonna leave this alone. You're not gonna touch this until we are almost done with the obi, okay? But we're gonna stack this the way we want and then we're gonna pleat it, okay? So now I've got this pleat in my hand. I'm going to grab the knot. Hi, here's my fingers, okay? I'm gonna grab the knot and the bow, and now I'm gonna steal this middle part here because this is what's gonna keep the bow attached to that knot, not to the bottom layer of the obi. So this part of the obi, we are not touching this. We are only worried about the bow and the knot. And this is gonna wrap around both the bow and the knot. Here it comes. If I can go around twice, then fabulous. If I can't, don't worry about it. I'm gonna to try to go around twice, and then I have the bow and then the bottom layer of obi. I'm gonna take this middle portion and tuck it between the body and the obi. If it goes into your magic belt, that's fine. Don't worry about it. And then I'm just gonna kinda of zhuzh it and make sure it looks cute. So here is our ruffle bow. Now, before we turn around and do the last reveal, we're gonna add one more touch, and that touch is called an obijime. The obijime is a cord that goes around the middle of the obi. Now, for certain obi ties, the obijime is essential. You cannot make the tie without this cord. For the bunko bow and any variation of it like this, you don't need this for structural integrity of the knot but we're adding it because they're fun, they're decorative, they're really nice. So I'm gonna take the obijime, find the middle, take the middle to the middle of the obi, I'm gonna wrap it around, I'm gonna have you hold this in front here for me, thank you. So it's just basically gonna be just a straight line across the obi, okay? Now I'm gonna have you turn around, we're going to adjust our front bow because we've got such a nice back bow, and then we're going to take the obijime, we're gonna make it into a square knot. So I've got one side crossing over the other. I'm gonna wrap it around. I've got a top side and a bottom side. The top side goes over the bottom side and then comes through. So that's how you get a knot that has the sides that go straight to the right and to the left. We're gonna tuck up and tuck up. So we just have two little poofs on the sides here. And then make sure that everything is laying nice and straight. And here we are. Love Live Kimono Cosplay. This segment is about komon. Now the word komon kind of sounds like the English word common. And you can use that as a mental hook to realize that common are for common, everyday occurrences. So things like going to the grocery store, meeting up with some friends, getting a coffee, things like that. Now, in order to demonstrate how common are worn, I need to summon our Tangerine Mountain intern, Lisa. So let me um, draw my summoning circle here. Ready? Here we go. And... Hey! Success! First thing that we're going to need to do is talk about what we wear underneath a komon, right? Because when we meet people at conventions, they're typically wearing something like what Lisa's wearing right here, which is just regular everyday clothing, right? Now, there are kimono under things, but at conventions, we don't really expect people to have this kind of thing on. So we're gonna start with Lisa just as she is like this, and we're gonna put on the first layer that typically goes underneath the komon. And that layer is called the nagajuban. Sometimes we'll abbreviate it as juban, but it's basically an, an underlayer for the kimono so that you're cleaning that more so than you're cleaning the actual kimono. 
This is a Nagajuban. One of the ways that you can tell that it's a Nagajuban is that the collar is going to be a different color than the rest of the juban. The collar is about the only part that typically shows when you're wearing the kimono. Another thing that you can also do to make wearing nagajuban easier is you can insert a collar stiffener like this, it's called an erishin, inside to make that collar sit very nicely against the nape of the neck. Nagajuban are also typically a little bit shorter than kimono. So I'm gonna have you turn a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap the nagajuban basically the same way that we do a kimono. So we're going to put the right hand side down first and then we're going to put the left hand side down but we're also going to make sure that this drape to the nape of the neck is where we want it to be. I'm going to take the koshihimo, wrap it around, cross it, bring it forward and then I'm just going to twist it around and then tuck the ends underneath. Now, if you want to knot it, you can do that too. And sometimes that's what I'll do at conventions because I find that um, things can get disheveled a little bit easier at a convention. Okay, so now this is it. That This is what's on here. Uh, we've got a nice drape to the nape of the neck and we have our kimono shaped sleeves and we're ready to get the kimono on. All right, we have a lovely antique komon. Now, one of the ways that you know it's a komon is that the pattern repeats all throughout the kimono. We're going to open it up, find the back of the collar, and we're going to start feeding the arms into the sleeves. So we're going to basically put this on just like it's a robe, and we're going to line up, I'm gonna have you turn, the back of the kimono with this drape to the nape of the neck. Now, one of the things that can be very helpful for getting dressed in kimono is the use of kimono clips. You can just basically put a clip right there. Now, you don't have to have clips. They're just a convenience. Some people use clothespins as well. These are lined with silicone, so they're very nice and really effective in keeping the kimono in good place. Um, you also want to have about a fist's worth of drape to the nape of the neck for women's pieces, okay? So now we're going to take the sleeves of the Nagajuban and we're going to make sure that they are fed through the armhole into the sleeve drop of the kimono. Now, a common question that we get when it comes to Nagajuban is what to do when your Nagajuban sleeves don't match the kimono sleeves. This is actually a very common issue. One thing that you can always do is take your kimono sleeve and fold it inside itself, tuck it in. At some point you can also stitch, run just a very simple basting stitch to keep this sleeve exactly at the same height as your kimono sleeve. But in this case, Again, we're assuming we're at a convention. We're just gonna lay the sleeve in here nicely and we're going to do the same thing for the other side. The kimono, this particular kimono, because of its age, has a little bit of a longer sleeve drop than you might typically see in a komon, but we picked it because it's just such a lovely piece. Now, we need a koshihimo. We're going to bring the kimono up to about ankle height. And we're going to just kind of test to see where the panels are going to be and if we need to shimmy the kimono so that we have the front panel crossing the body the way that we want. So once we kind of know where we want to be, make sure we're at a good height cross over and remember once again you're going right side down and then left side down because if you cross the kimono the other way you're actually the guest of honor at a funeral. So from here I'm going to also judge whether or not I'm going to have ohashori. Ohashori is a fold that is usually along the hip line. Now for some older kimono and depending upon your height you might or might not have and ohashori. You can also modify where the ohashori 
is going to hit your body depending upon how high up you tie your koshihimo. Because this is an older piece, even though Lisa is much closer to the Japanese national standard height than I am, um, I'm still tying this a little bit lower on her body. So you just basically have to know your own body and just know the kimono. Um, again, I'm just, you know, twisting, twist it again, tucking up. But of course, if you want to tie the tie, you can always do that, especially at a convention when you're moving around a lot. So now that we have the bottom situated, we've got everything kind of the, laying the way that we like it from the waist down. The top is going to look messy and that's okay, that's normal, don't panic. We just start from the bottom and then we work our way up. So from here, I'm going to try to make sure that the kimono collar is situated along the back of the Nagajuban collar. And this is just gonna help me situate everything else. Now, a good way to help with that is a tool called a kimono clip. It's basically just a silicone lined clip, that's it. Some people use clothespins, some people use those little uh, binder clips, it's all good. Now, I'm going to bring the kimono up and blouse it over the tie, and then I'm going to cross the collar in the front and just tug the fabric down so that it falls neatly. And if you need to use a second clip to bring this part together and hold it, then go ahead and do that. Now, there's an important historical note about the Nagajuban, because you might think, okay, well, what's the big deal about this? I only see a little bit of collar. Why do I need to wear one of these anyway? The answer is, you kind of don't. When you look at kimono magazines, you'll often see the people who are pictured, they're wearing the kimono, they're wearing the Nagajuban underneath, and it creates this nice double collared look. Sort of a throwback to the Juni Hitole of the Heian period, but, Remember that kimono are fashion, and fashion has evolved over time. So we have some glorious examples of photography from a photographer named Felice Beato, who came to Japan not long after the country opened up. Um, and the people that he photographed were all just engaging in everyday life. A lot of them were combining kimono with other types of garments, everything from button-down Western-style shirts that had just sort of made it into the country, so they were cool, they were new. Um, sometimes kimono were layered with um, Chinese-style shirts that had almost like a bandit collar going across the front, so that's a very interesting look. Um, in modern kimono magazines, a lot of times you'll see kimono experts and, and fashionistas, they'll be wearing something like a turtleneck with a kimono on over it. So you're not restricted to wearing nagajuban only. And in fact, a lot of our customers decide to pair kimono with other kinds of items in a very fashion forward look. So while this might be seen as a strictly traditional look, you don't have to do it. You can combine a glorious kimono like this with really anything that looks cool with it. So moving on, we're going to now just lock down this ohashori. One of the tools that we're going to use to lock this down is called a datejime. It's basically a sash that has a little bit of a stiffener in it. You can actually make one of these at home if you like. You don't have to buy an official one. It's just a little wider sash that kind of helps us to keep everything locked down. And in fact, I'm just going, I'm actually gonna tie this one off. Just a small knot in here, okay? And that's all that is, it's just a simple wide sash. Now from here, we're going to put on the obi. So the obi that we've selected with this kimono is a Nagoya obi. It starts out narrow on the part that is going to go around the body, and then it gets wider as you go along towards the end, and obviously it gets more decorated. Now the knot that we're going to use for this is a knot that we were taught years and years ago by a lovely obasan in little Tokyo um, in California. And what she said was that 
Many times they get people buying kimono and they don't maybe have the money to buy an obiage and an obijime and all kinds of accessories for tying obi. So she taught people this type of tie that she sort of called the California sushi roll, just to be funny. Um, and she liked it too because it was also pretty disability friendly, it's kind of arthritis friendly. So we've adopted that tie and we use it a lot at conventions for people who want to make a knot that looks kind of like an otaiko, but is a little bit easier to accomplish, especially if you're a beginner or if you have difficulty with your hands. So we're gonna get started doing that. We're gonna take the end, or the te, and we're gonna place it against the body, basically wherever we feel like starting. And we're just gonna wrap it around. Sometimes you can just, if the obi is slippery, slippery enough, you can kind of coil it around. We're just gonna get a feel for where we want the decorative portion to appear along the body. We're gonna start about here. Now because we have two layers, we're gonna feel for the second layer and just kind of use both of them to make this snug. Not to the point where you can't breathe, but just snug. Now every Nagoya Obi by and large is going to have a bit of a triangle fold to it to help you fold the obi when it's um, not being worn because you have the skinny end that has to transition into the wider end. So your goal is to basically line this up with your spine. So we're gonna bring this around, spin you around. You can also do this tie in the front and then you kind of suck it in and spin it around to the back. But basically, I'm gonna use a clip here just to help keep this in place while I talk. Um, but we're gonna basically end up with what looks like a really beautiful tail sort of going down the back of your body with the points of the OB here pointing up, that fold pointing up. So from here, we're going to take the very end, we're gonna kind of flip it over. We're gonna take this whole part here, I'm gonna pull it up through straighten out anything that needs to be straightened. I can take this clip off now. Now, depending upon how much you want to shorten this, you can roll it again. So I'm gonna do that real fast. I'm gonna sort of reach through, pull the end, pull it out, and then just straighten. Straighten, straighten. And as you can see, we kind of have what looks like a decorative pillow on the back of the body here. But this is pretty much what an otaiko fold looks like. Now from here, we have just maybe a little bit of tail and to, again, sort of simulate the otaiko fold, we're gonna take part of the OB and we're gonna kind of fold it in on itself here. So we're just gonna zigzag it as you kind of see right here. We're gonna take that fold and we're gonna tuck it up underneath all of the layers so that it's basically tension that is holding this to the body. We're just gonna basically feed the hand in here to make sure that that fold is nice and straight and straighten it out. So this is looking good. Now we have to make sure that we remove our clips. If you turn back around, we're almost done at this point. If you wanted to leave it from here, you can. However, there is a really nice touch that adds to that whole traditional feel of the obi. So that part is called an obijime. The obijime is a long braided cord that typically has some kind of tassel towards the end. And what we're gonna do here is feed the obijime through the pillow, through that loop in the back, bring it forward, center it right, up, right below the sternum, take the two ends, cross them, bring the bottom one around and tuck it. 
give it a little tug. Then your top is going to go underneath the bottom and pull through. And this is how we get this lovely crisscrossed knot. It's a square knot. And then from here, we're just tucking up these two little tassels to the sides. So here we are with a komon kimono and a California sushi roll obi with the um, obi jime added just as a lovely little accent. In this segment, we're going to talk about a step up in formality from the komon, and that is the homongi. The homongi is known as visiting wear, and it's a semi-formal type of kimono. To show you how this works, I'm going to have to summon our Tangerine Mountain intern, Lisa. And I think I've got just the trick for it. Hang on. I think I need a kimono. Here's our homongi. All right, so it's just nothing behind the curtain, nothing in front of the curtain. And Lisa! So the homongi is a type of kimono that has pattern in strategic places throughout the kimono. Lisa has already started out in a nagajuban here because she is just that prepared. So we're going to start by putting the homongi on. Thread the arms through the sleeve openings. One of the ways that you can distinguish a homongi from a komon is that there are patterns in very specific places on the kimono. So one area is the left hand shoulder and also the front of the left hand sleeve. Then in sort of a mirrored way, the back of the right hand sleeve and if you could turn, the back of the right hand shoulder. And then if you want to turn back around for me. And then of course the pattern is going to be very important on the front left panel so that you can have this towards the front of the body, whereas the other panel is going to be relatively plain. One of the things that you might notice about your kimono is that the collar may seem very wide. Now, many times we might think in the West we want to pop that collar out, but actually we want to turn it in so that it's maybe about two inches or so wide. Now, some kimono already have this stitched down. So if yours is like that, then don't worry about this part. But if it's not, you want to make sure that this part is folded in, not that you have the sort of popped collar look with your kimono. Now, in order to get this on the body, we're going to need to shimmy it up so that we raise the hemline to adjust it to your body. So I need a tool to do that. I'll be right back. We have our koshihimo. I'm going to lift this up so that the hemline of the kimono is right around the ankles. And we've put the right hand side down first and then the left hand side because otherwise, we are the guest of honor at a funeral. And I have brought the himo around. I'm already just starting to sort of prearrange some of the ohashori. And you wanna just give the ends a little bit of a tug. Don't make them so tight that you can't breathe. Okay. I'm basically taking the two ends of the koshihimo and I'm just giving them a twist. I'm gonna give it one more twist. And then I'm going to tuck the ends underneath the part wrapped around the body. And in this way, I have the bottom of the kimono already situated. So the idea with getting dressed in kimono is that you're starting from the bottom and you're working your way up. Get your hemline situated and then work on the rest. If the top is messy, don't worry about it. We're going to fix it later. One of the features of women's kimono is that they're often very long because the intention is that you're going to create what's called ohashori. 
And if you need to pull out any more of the ohashori here, you can just lift a little and gently tug. And the idea is that you're gonna try to make this just a straight, even fold all around the body here. Now I'm going to have you turn this way. Excellent. Now another way that you can help to ensure that this part of the collar stays put is with a clip just along here. You can also take a clip, which I have hidden in my obi, and place it along the ohashori. And this can help to keep everything neatly arranged. For this particular homongi, as is the case actually with most homongi, this one is silk, homongi are nicer wear. They're nicer than everyday wear. So while a homon might be made out of anything from cotton to wool to you know silk, yes, the homongi is typically made of something like silk and sometimes it will be very slippery. Um, so the slipperier the kimono is, don't be afraid to add more sashes. Don't be afraid to add more tools just to help you lock everything down. Don't wrestle with it in frustration. Just tie more things. Just tie, tie, tie. If you have to wrap yourself up in many koshihimo, that's okay. So I'm gonna take another koshihimo and put it along here just to help secure everything. Just twisting. And it's, it's the same procedure for the koshihimo every time. You're just twisting and tucking, or you can knot it if you're more comfortable with that. All right. I'm also going to add a magic belt. That's another tool that you can use to kind of help keep the ohashori locked down. Did I put the magic? Wait, oh, oh, yes, that's right. Ah, magic belts. This is basically a rubberized strip, and that rubberized strip grips the fabric of the kimono very nicely. There's a little bit of Velcro on the other side too. So what we're gonna do is wrap this around, and that rubberized strip helps to grip the kimono so that the layers don't go anywhere. So this can really be your best friend, especially when you're wearing a very silky kimono. All right, and I think at this point, what we need is the uh, the obi. Yeah, we're at the obi phase. So we're gonna put the mm, oh here, <laughs> magic obi. So this type is called a hukuro obi. It is all flats. One side is plain. And the other side is uh, pretty glorious. What we're going to do is find the part of the obi that in the front is a little bit plain because this is supposed to be wrapped around the body. And then the rest of this is supposed to appear towards the back. In order to get started, we have to fold this portion in half, almost like a hot dog bun. And now we're going to do a fold or a knot, a musubi, called an otaiko musubi. We're going to put a healthy amount of this obi in the front of the body here. And Lisa, I'm gonna have you hang on to that for me real fast. The rest is going to come over the shoulder. Now, at the end, this portion here is going to be sort of inserted into the pillow that essentially is the otaiko. I'm going to lift your arm and bring this around. A lot of times when you're doing this, especially if you're doing it on yourself, you can basically trap this underneath the first layer of the wrap of the obi. That's a really convenient thing to do, actually. I'm also giving the back a bit of a tug to straighten it out a little bit. So the goal is to wrap your body twice. We have completed two wraps here. 
We have the te, which is this end part here. We have wrap number one and wrap number two. I'm going to have you turn for me. Because now we're going to focus on the back. From here, I'm going to bring this portion across the back. And then I'm going to take the te, which is this part that is plain and then a little bit decorated. And I am going to swirl them. You can do a knot if you want. There are sort of variations of the otaiko that involve that, but we're going to swirl them. And then we're going to take this portion. I'm going to hold on to this and spin you back around again. Some tutorials actually have you fold it like a triangle and then just sort of tuck it into the front. This is just temporary. This is basically just to hang on to this, keep it where it is, let it stay put, because we're not gonna need to worry about it until a little bit later. All right, and we're going to spin you around because now we're going to deal with the other end of the obi called the tare. Now, just to give you an idea as to how this finished product is going to look, we're basically going to create a sort of like a fold in the back here. And then we're going to end up creating another fold here. And this otaiko fold was actually designed to, to commemorate the opening of the otaiko bridge. But it sort of looks like a pillow at the back here. Now, in order to achieve this look, we're going to need some tools. And the tools are going to help with the securing the bottom part and also the top part. We're not going to worry about the bottom just yet. We're going to worry about this top portion here. Now, in order to secure this, we're going to need two things. One is called an obimakura. Makura means pillow. So we're going to have an, basically a little pillow sitting up here. Um, underneath this fabric and then we also need what's called an obiage and that's basically like a bustle sash you could you could think of it that way um, that's going to be wrapped around that pillow and then brought around to the front of the kimono so now I need those oh, they're not over there um, okay we need the oh wait here we go aha obimakura and then we need the obiage, which is a, oh wait, there we go. We're going to start this section by, let this fall, taking the obiage and wrapping the obimakura sort of like this. And this is going to just help keep this covered so that in case you see it, it looks nice. We're going to create a bit of a divot in here, a little bit of a fold. And we're going to decide where along the back this is going to be. We're going to take that pillow and I'm actually going to flip this up. When I'm doing this on myself, I don't always flip this over. But so that you can see what's going on, I'm going to place the obimakura basically above that swirl here against essentially the backside of the fabric. I'm going to bring the ends around and I'm just going to temporarily tuck them into the obi you could tie them too if you want. You're going to redo that tie eventually. Whatever works. Now we have the obimakura here and we have the obiage wrapped around the obimakura and it's around the body in a, it's in a holding pattern. It's in a temporary position. We're gonna fix it later. So this part is done. Now we need to do the bottom portion we're going to need to bring this up. There is another part of the obi though that we need to work with as we get this done here, and that is the te. So that's the other end of the obi that we tucked in the front beforehand. So I'm going to retrieve that from its 
position and bring it here. So what happens next is a little bit of origami, you could say. But I'm going to take this, fold it in on itself until this bottom line is right along this little bar in the obi. So now I've got this. I'm going to take the tay, and the tay is basically going to be nestled in that fold here. The tay ends up looking sort of like a bar. sort of comes out of the loop of the otaiko. So from here, we need a cord to tuck this down. Where did I put it? Uh, oh, wait. Aha! You'll be hides everything. I'm going to take this cord and basically thread it underneath just the first layer. that through. If it's not perfect, don't worry, because we still have some adjusting and we only have temporary ties in the front. So from here, we're going to turn you back around. So now at the front, <laughs> that's a little bit of a mess. Don't worry. We're going to, first of all, keep the tension on the obiage because that is, of course, what is keeping your obimakura up in the back here. Many obimakura have cords. They have their own tie. It's up to you whether or not you want to tie this. Some people find it uncomfortable. I like to make sure that mine are tied. And in fact, that takes some of the pressure off of the obiage. Tying that helps to make it possible to then arrange the obiage in a very decorative way. Usually, you'll want to take the edges of the obiage and just sort of roll them in on themselves like this. So that looks nice. This side is the same, same deal. Bring it in on itself. Make sure that it's nice and straight on the other side. Many times, obiage are shibori. This one is. The ends are going to be tucked into the obi. See, I wasn't lying when I said the obi hides everything. Keeping that tension, I'm going to shift this around. Now, again, I'm going to tie this temporarily because we're starting to see a little bit of a pucker in the obi. So I'm just going to do a very temporary tie because I need to find the obi eta. Um, oh, here. This board can be inserted between the layers of the obi to help give it a nice smooth look, even when this is tied a little bit more snugly. 
Now, there are many decorative ways to tie an obijime. I'm going to twist this over one more time. I'm going to twist this one over one more time. And then I'm going to bring them together, twist and twist, and make a lovely decorative knot in the front. Now for the ohashori, we can always lengthen this. Ideally you'd like to have maybe a little bit more, but one of the things that we have found, um, especially working with so many folks who have not worn kimono very frequently before, is that having that extra bit of fabric around the hips is sometimes very uncomfortable for some people. So what we'll sometimes do is actually take the ohashori and tuck that into the obi just to give a little bit more of a streamlined look. Um, sometimes you'll also find that if you are a particularly tall person, you may not be able to easily find kimono that give you ohashori. So you may have no choice but to go without ohashori. It, it's just one of those things that the kimono wearing community all over the world accepts that you do it if you can, if you want to, but if you can't do it or if you don't want to do it, it, it's it's an option. So in this case, I think we're just going to leave that as is. All right, so here we are, Homonki with Otaiko Musubi. In this segment, we're going to be talking about the most formal kimono that we've covered so far, which is the furisode. The furisode is known for its long, swinging sleeves. And to show you how they're worn, I need to summon our intern, Lisa. Let me think, how am I gonna do that this time? Um, oh, yes, okay, we're gonna do it like Disney. Um, All right, Lisa, now we are already in our Hurisode Juban, and this Juban features these long sleeves that we're going to be placing inside the Hurisode sleeves. We also have a lovely decorative collar here. This is optional, but it adds a nice little touch when you're wearing it with the Hurisode over it. So I'm going to get the Hurisode, and we're going to get it on you. We have a lovely black furisode here that has a pattern called noshi on it. You'll see it a little bit later. But for right now, we are going to place this along the back of the juban, and I've already folded down the eri or the collar of the furisode. So I'm gonna have you step a little bit this way. Excellent. And I'm gonna make sure that this collar is lined up in the back. Okay. This is put on with the sleeves brought down into the furisode sleeve. So what I'm doing right here is just pulling this down the arm and then pulling the furisode over it and then making sure that the fabric is just flowing down the sleeve evenly. Sometimes it's helpful when wearing furisode to have the person getting dressed take the sleeves and wrap them around once or twice just to keep them out of the way. So I'm going to do that and that will kind of make our lives a little bit easier. So just like we do with any kimono, we're going to shimmy up the back to the heels. We're going to do a check to make sure that the kimono is wrapped the way that we want it. We're putting the right side down first and then the left hand side. Now with furisode, it's pretty easy to tell which panel goes down first and which panel goes down second. The pattern on the front typically indicates what you want to see here. So I'm bringing the koshihimo around, crossing it, 
bringing it around to the front. I'm going to give this a twist and a twist and then a tuck. But of course, especially if you're wearing a furisore at um, a convention or someplace where you expect to be moving around quite a bit, maybe if you're doing a photo shoot, you may just want to knot it. So the bottom is set. The top now looks messy. We're going to fix that. I'm going to blouse up this ohashori and I'm going to bring the collar together in front. And then from here, just to help keep everything in place, we're going to add another koshihimo. After this, we're going to get the magic belt. So again, I'm just wrapping it around, bringing it to the front. I'm doing a twist. I'm gonna twist it again. And I'm going to tuck. From this point, we're going to get the magic belt. So the magic belt is, of course, a sash that is essentially rubberized along the back and has Velcro along one end. This magic belt is a wonderful invention because it acts like a koshihimo, but it also has this coating that helps keep the fabric in place even as you move. Now for the obi for furisode, you don't just want to necessarily go with a simple tie. This is for a formal occasion. So we're going to show you an obi knot that is a very pretty knot. It's something that a lot of people like. It's called a sparrow knot. And it looks a little bit like an otaiko, but you've added wings to the process. For this furisode, we have an awesome hukuro obi. The hukuro obi is the same width throughout the entire obi. The back portion is just plain, typically. And then there's usually some amount of fabric on the front that is also plain. So you're gonna wanna find that plain area first. And then oftentimes there's a, a bit of weaving or decoration on the very end of the obi. This is called the te. So you're gonna basically find the te and fold it in half like a hot dog bun. And you're gonna find that many, many obi ties start out this way no matter how complex they are. We are going to start with the te draped over the shoulder, almost down to the opposite hip. And so then I'm going to have Lisa turn. And as is pretty typical, keep going for me. We're going to wrap around the body twice. I'm going to bring this part around the body and I'm just going to pinch it a little bit because now I'm going to still the te. I'm going to fold it a little bit and I'm going to swirl. So really this obi tie starts out a lot like an otaiko. I'm going to bring the te back around. Hang on to that for me for just a minute. All right, now from here, I'm going to just take a clip and place it along the OB to keep these layers together. Now I'm going to bring this here because I'm going to use my next tool. Ordinarily for an otaiko, this part would just be inserted into the loop in the back that forms the main portion of the otaiko. But in this case, we're going to bring it up roughly to the shoulder. Then you're going to find the end of where you folded the te over, and you're going to want to start to pleat it. Now you'll notice in my, on my wrist here, I have a couple of rubber bands. We have those there for a reason. You can use anything for this part of the obi tie. I've used everything from baby headbands to rubber bands to hair ties. It, it really doesn't matter. What we are doing right now is forming the first wing, and then we're going to be creating the second wing out of part of the tare. We're going to bring it up to the other shoulder, again, not going too far over. And then we're going to pleat this the same way that we did the other side. 
Once that is done, I'm going to take my second band. I'm going to wrap it around. Now from here, we need to create the, essentially the hump that we need to create for the otaiko. For right now, just to reduce weight, I'm gonna pass this forward here. And like magic, have my obimakura and my obiage. Now you will see in kimono magazines and instructional books. Many times they'll present this and it'll be nicely wrapped in the obiage and they'll just sort of wrap it around and tuck it and everything works out great. And I find that especially when I'm dressing myself, that doesn't necessarily happen. So I'm going to put the naked makura against the crisscross of the wings, just a little bit above it. Okay, it's gonna seem real high, but again, remember this is a formal tie, so that's okay. I'm going to let this drop for one second so that you can see what I'm doing. I'm pressing the makura, again, just above where the wings cross. I'm gonna bring this tie underneath a wing, pass it forward, and then I'm going to do the same thing for the other side. And then I'm going to tie this in the front. Usually I will just tuck things and just do sort of a temporary little tie. But in this case, I'm getting it right the first time. We're going to take the obiage and wrap the obimakura. I'm just gonna bring it forward and tuck it. I'm gonna bring the other side forward underneath the wing and I'm gonna tuck that in on the other side. Already it's actually not looking too bad in the front, but we will floof it later. Now, you may have noticed that I still have another koshihimo around my neck and that's because we need this one. Like I said before, you're not actually using the makura to fully support the top of the otaiko the way you usually would. What we're doing here is we're forming a box pleat because we want the otaiko to come from basically the middle of the wings here. So I'm going to take the koshihimo and basically just put it underneath my box pleats. I'm gonna ride this pleat up and I'm gonna keep my koshihimo here. Now, we went under for the obiage, but we're gonna go over the wings for this koshihimo because this is gonna be hidden along the top of the body. I'm gonna hand that to you. Thank you. This is gonna go over the wing. Then here again, because this is structurally important, I'm going to tie this. I do mine in knots. You don't have to, you can twist and tuck. Sometimes I will even do it in a bow because to be real, all of this gets tucked into the obi anyway, and you're not going to see it. Okay, so we are almost done. We are going to see some amount of obiage here, and that's good, that's what we want. We're going to let this box pleat start to fan out. We're going to take the bottom part of the tare, and we're gonna try to line up the bottom loop bottom part of this loop. So we're, we're kind of doing a zigzag because we're gonna bring this down and tie it off about here. So once you have this roughly situated where you want it, understanding that you can always adjust it a little bit, especially if this ends up crooked, which mine always does until I fix it. You're going to take your obijime, I'm gonna pass that through. Bring that forward. If you have an obijime that is designed for a furisode, it might have extra smaller pieces that come from a split in the braid. So I'm gonna start out with just a very simple square knot here. 
I'm gonna tuck the tassel up. That part's easy. For this, I'm going to bring these up. This is the artistic part. You can do this however you like. I like making a sine wave, actually, sort of across the graph. It's just kind of a way to incorporate a little bit of math nerdum for all of you mathematicians out there. And I'm just going to press them up, tuck them back up underneath the OBG may, straighten them out, make sure I like how everything is laying. I'm thinking like everything looks pretty good here. And here we are. Now, just so you know, a way, good way to pose with a hoodie sode is to take your wrist opening, catch it, and then hold this out beautifully so that you can demonstrate what a glorious butterfly you are. In this segment, we're going to change things up a little bit and talk about men's kimono. But of course, before I can do that, I need a man. Now, last time I did this, I got a kaiju, so let's hope this works. <sighs> Here we are, and let's summon a man, hopefully, and not a kaiju. <laughs> All right, I got both. <laughs> So this is John from Fast Food Anime. Hi. Hi. And he is going to help me demonstrate how men's kimono are worn. And in fact, I'm gonna let you hold on to this because, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so John, I'm gonna have you step right over here and you can, you, can, you can just keep on eating. All right. Now, typically, we would start with a men's nagajuban. This is an example of one. The design on this is very nice, and that's because of a lot of history that we don't really have a lot of time to get into in this segment. But because John is wearing this nice shirt, we're gonna Felice Beato it up a little bit here and do a throwback to the Meiji period when a lot of guys were mixing Western and Japanese fashion. So we're going to go straight to the kimono. We have a lovely blue Simugi kimono that we're going to feed right onto John's arms right there. Now, one of the main differences that you'll notice between men's and women's kimono is that if you can lift your arm, this is closed at the underarm. Now, in women's, like mine, that is open. Part of the reason for that is that women's obi tend to sit higher up on the body. So you need to have the sleeve a little bit more separated. What we're gonna see here is for John Zobi, we're gonna be setting it a little bit lower on the body. And so we don't need to have this open. Now the procedure for getting a men's kimono on is pretty similar to women's. So we can put this down now. We're basically going to make sure that the kimono is laying nicely. We're going to also make sure that we can just see that Western collar, because this is basically acting as a nagajuban, where you would see the second collar showing just above the collar of the kimono. So otherwise, this is pretty similar. This should be pretty familiar. We're going to put the right-hand side down first and then the left-hand side, because if we go the other way, we are the guest of honor at a funeral. We are going to take the koshihimo, and place it along basically the belt line. If you could wrap it twice, great. If not, don't worry. I'm going to twist and then tuck and then twist and tuck. All right, so now that this is set, we're actually almost done. We just need to get the obi. The obi for a men's kimono 
tends to be a little bit narrower than that for the women's kimono. Again, remember that this is sitting lower on the body. It's not sitting as high up. The women's obi, you'll see this is much narrower than mine. Um, it sits higher on my body. This is going to sit much lower. It doesn't need to be wide. There are historical reasons for this. Again, don't have time to get into all of those details, but this type of obi is also called a kaku obi. The designs on the obi are very tightly woven. So this is a very strong obi. If there was a fire at the house, you could probably, if you, if you tied a good enough knot, you could probably tie this to something and go down, go out the window with this. <laughs> it's that strong. So I'm gonna have John turn and face this way. I'm going to make sure that the back center seam is lined up nicely. I'm gonna have you turn just like that. Another thing to notice too about the collar for the men's kimono is that it's pretty much right up against the neck. For the women's, we want to create a bit of a drape to the nape of the neck. For the guys, we don't do that. We're going to show you um, an obi tie first that is called a kainokuchi. The kainokuchi means um, clamshell mouth, and so it's basically going to look like a check mark. Um, in fact, I can show you that's what mine looks like. <laughs> Now, this is a unisex tie. This is a tie that works no matter what. So it's a great tie to learn and it's really pretty simple. It's basically a glorified double knot. I'm gonna start by taking a good amount of obi here and crossing it over, putting it over the shoulder. Doesn't matter which shoulder, we're just, I'm starting with this one. Then I'm going to take the obi and wrap it over the koshihimo, again, keeping it low on the body. I'm just gonna sort of pinch this a little bit just to make it look a little bit more like a check mark against the back. And give it a little bit of a tug. All right, so that's the first part. Just wrap it around the body twice. Now, while this portion is still up here, we're going to take the end of this obi and bring it in towards the side of the body. So we're basically creating a bit of a loop. It's tension that's going to hold this end of the obi against the body. So this is going to be one of the pieces for our glorified double knot. The second piece is here. I'm basically going to take this portion of the obi and I'm also gonna fold this in on itself. So now these two pieces of the obi are sort of double layered. This top portion of the obi is folded in half like a hot dog bun. So we're going to make sure that we're maintaining that fold. Now I want you to remember, we've got kind of a skinny end and a fat end because one of the main things to remember about kainokuchi is that the skinny end goes first. We're going to take the skinny end and put it down. We're going to take the fat end and we're going to pinch it and then tuck it around the skinny end. We're going to bring it up. We're gonna take the skinny end and we're just gonna kind of tug it a little bit. Now I still wanna make sure that that skinny end it's looking nice and skinny. Now remember I said skinny end goes first. Skinny end is gonna come back up and then the fat end is gonna come down. It's going to go underneath the skinny end and it's going to come out to the side. If you wanna give it a little tug, you can do that. It's not meant to be a super tight knot. You know, we don't wanna tighten it so much that it looks sort of solid. We want this to look like a check mark. We're going to tilt this just slightly so that the skinny end is up towards the hip and so that the wider end is a little bit more centered to the body. All right, and then that's it. That's the men's kimono with the kainokuchi obi tie. Now there is an additional obi tie that we can do. The obi tie for the kainokuchi 
It's a nice, easy unisex tie. But if you're wearing hakama, or if you just like bow ties, because bow ties are cool, we can do a bow tie, basically, but in the back. So we're going to turn John around one more time. <laughs> the bow tie basically starts the same way as the kainokuchi, with some over the shoulder. There we are. And then some obi coming out here. However, we don't need quite as much. So we're gonna loosen up on that, and some of that, and some of that. Ugh, dev, there we go. So we're going to bring this section of the obi to cross the body. We're going to bring the shoulder portion around, tuck it up underneath, and we're going to make a knot. You can make this knot very strong, because again, this, this type of obi is very, very strong. I'm going to hand that to you. I have folded this portion of the obi in half. For the other portion, you notice this obi is double-sided, so you can actually create a little bit of contrast. I'm going to decide how big I want the ears of the bow, usually about maybe the size of your hand. That's not a bad metric. I'm gonna basically just fold it in on itself a few times and just size it up. I'm going to just basically pinch it in the middle. So this is going to almost act like a binder clip to hold on to the knot. I've got this grip. You can see my fingers here. This works just like the bunko. We're just going smaller. Now I'm going to still this, keeping this at half width which is nice because you can see this little bit of contrast. I'm bringing this up and around the knot and the bow. I'm going to wrap this around. Pull it a little snug. Bring it around as much as you need to. And then I'm gonna tuck the rest between the body and the obi. Then from here, I'm just going to arrange the layers to make sure that I like how this bow is looking. Now, there is one more option that we can show you. This is a really cool tie that we picked up fairly recently here. So I'm gonna turn John around one more time. <laughs> All right. This next tie is one that we saw quite a lot at the Kimono Salon Nihonbashi in 2018. It's called the Ronin Musubi. Ronin meaning wandering masterless samurai. And we were really excited to pick up this tie out there. The, the Kimono Salon is an expo that happens every year in Tokyo. It's one of the premier ones out there and we were really excited to be invited. So let's get started showing you this tie. Now I learned it starting over the left hand shoulder. You can always mirror image what I'm doing here, but we're gonna feed some obi over that shoulder. And if you could hang on to that for me. And then we're going to wrap twice around the body. And just like with the kainokuchi, we're going to tuck this end in on the side here. So we want maybe about, maybe about 18 inches. Now I'm gonna take this part and I'm gonna do very similar. I'm gonna just bring it in on itself. Again, very, very similar to kainokuchi. I'm gonna fold it in half like a hot dog bun. Now remember what I said before, that skinny side goes first. So the skinny side is gonna go down first and the wider side is gonna wrap around the skinny side and come up to make a knot. Now from here, we're going to, again, skinny side first. So this looks, again, a lot like kainokuchi. 
the fatten is going to come down over the skinny end, but instead of wrapping around, we're going to hook the first layer of obi here. And we're going to pass this underneath that layer and pull it through. So that by the time we're done, we end up with a tie that looks sort of like a crisscross and ends up coming out a little bit to the side. So that's the donin tie. Now, John, I'm gonna have you turn around and you look very fashionable. Um, you're on your last one, aren't you? <laughs> I hope it was good. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, and what does it say on the front there? Enjoy happiness. Share happiness. Share happiness. Share there happiness. you go. All right. We hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks to everybody at Anime Iowa for letting us bring this content to you. We also want to thank John from Fast Food Anime and Lisa, our intern, for helping us. Now, if you like this video, please subscribe to our new YouTube channel and like it, and also share it with your friends. Also, we're available on our social media at Facebook at Tangerine Mountain and on Instagram at Tangerine Kimono. You can also find us at www.tangerinemountain.com to learn more about kimono or maybe to get one of your own. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next year at Anime Iowa. Please stay safe and healthy. Bye.